do institutional history. Um, a few years ago, I was invited to a symposium that was looking at the, the, the foundations, the roots of a number of schools. And for whatever reason, I was invited to that, and that was my first taste. So I took a look at the founding of Lee. And so I did that project. And while I was doing that project, I, I did some reading more broadly. So I started looking at um, sort of the history of, you know, especially very specific sectarian schools and sort of what the, the growth pattern looked like and also why so many of our schools would start off as Bible training schools, you know, very narrowly focused, end up as you know, Vanderbilt, you know, end up completely outside of Christian education. So as I read about that, one of the things that struck me was the second project that Carolyn mentioned, which was it tends to be punctuated equilibrium on the move from the small, very specifically, narrowly defined Christian school well, to a non-Christian school. So you have long periods of stasis and then quick, <clears throat> quick movement. And one of those things was the search for accreditation. So when Bible schools look for accreditation from especially secular agencies, <coughs> they tend to have this rapid change. And so that was the second paper I did. I tested that, looked at that, presented that paper. And while I was, and this is the way research works, right? So while I was doing that paper, which was taking place in the 60s, I started running across these notes about mentions of and minutes, about segregation, desegregation, and about that process, which brought me this paper, which I had a colleague that was um, doing a, a paper about the navigators and their dealings with race, and she asked me to come do a paper with her on a panel, and the third paper is done. So they just sort of roll from one into the other. So that's, that's how I got here. Um, because you're my, my faculty colleagues, and because that makes me far more nervous than talking to students or a bunch of strangers, which is pretty easy, I'm going to read a lot of this and come off of it occasionally to try to hold your attention, but I'll, I'll stick a little bit to script. In 1966, 12 years after the landmark Brown decision, five years after the University of Tennessee at Knoxville desegregated its undergraduate classrooms, Lee College quietly opened its door to three African American students. The college and its sponsoring denomination, the Church of God, had operated as largely segregated institutions for almost five decades and were far from the forefront of the Civil Rights Movement. The move to reach a conclusion about what the administration called the racial problem had been actively debated in the school and denomination since the landmark Brown decision. And over the next decade, pressure from outside the denomination to desegregate steadily mounted as uh, the broader civil rights movement, the federal government, and peer institutions reshaped the landscape of higher education. In the end, the administration of Lee College and the leadership of the Church of God reluctantly desegregated. It's an important finding, I think. Only in the last resort did they conform to a cultural and political landscape that had been transformed by African Americans and the civil rights movement. Furthermore, in desegregating the campus in 1966, Lee and the Church, I would argue, missed an opportunity to confess past transgressions, openly welcome and integrate black students into the campus community, and take a leadership position on issues of racial justice. So as I go through my slides, there's, I, I was taught a long time ago in a presentation like this, there's like five things people might take away. So I have three what I consider missed opportunities, and I have two real positive outcomes that we'll work through, and I'll, I'll try to at least come up a little bit for error at, at those moments. So the Church of God's formative years took place at the same time the Southern states moved to institute, formalize Jim Crow systems. And I, my, my wife sort of reminded me that a lot of you probably hadn't taken American history since your freshman year in college. Yeah, you know that's probably true. So when you talk about these control systems in the South, you're talking about Jim Crow, which is the term most of us know, correct? So we're talk that's talking about legal segregation in the South. It was against the law you could be put in jail or fined for integrating in the South. And that was true for, for higher education as well as we'll find out in Tennessee. There was a 1901 law that forbade integration in Tennessee's higher education system. The second way was politically. And we're, we won't touch on that really in this case, but across the South there were a whole system of laws and traditions put in place that kept African Americans from voting. Very few African Americans could register to vote, much less vote in the South. Um, this is sometimes called the Mississippi Plan. It dealt with um, residency requirements and poll taxes and literacy tests, those things. And then the third thing, means of control, is economic. Um, and, and because of that, African Americans are kept 
largely either in sharecropping jobs in the rural South or in the urban South in some sort of servant position. So with these means of control, you know, the South and its Southerners um, limit the opportunities for African Americans. It's in this context then that Lee College and the denomination, the Church of God, is for, are formed. So it should be a surprise then that, that Lee's also going to be segregated. The, in this case, the Bible Training School early on will be segregated. So, in this context, the church slowly followed suit in a move that satisfied both its white and to some degree its black members who preferred some autonomy in the church rather than be under the direct control of white administrators. By 1927, segregation in the church was complete. For the next four decades, the Church of God would maintain separate conferences, administrative office, an orphanage, a publication for its black members. Paralleling the broader geography of race relations, the church allowed blacks in non-segregated states, um, and that status was determined by the nature of public schools in the state, to opt out of the colored church system and to work within the white assemblies, um, the white assemblies and under the um, administration of a white general overseer. At the denomination's annual general assembly, blacks had voting rights. They led a Saturday night worship service, but they were segregated from white attendees by a rope that ran the length of the room and all the way through the campus of the flagship institution, the Bible Training School, which for convenience sake, I'll largely just call Lee College, but the Bible Training School at the time. Um, this is the status quo then, while the Bible Training School is in operation through the foundation of Lee College. We're a segregated school, we're segregated by, by state law. In 1954 and 55, that changes, and y'all should know why that changes. There's a landmark Supreme Court decision which opens up the possibility of integrating education in higher education, and that would be the Brown versus the Board decision. It's also in 1955, however, that the school starts a really remarkable period of change. And that change includes the consolidation of really diverse educational enterprises into a single four-year liberal arts school, overcoming a major financial crisis, the pursuit and winning of accreditation from the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. At the same time they're doing that, so this major organizational shift within the school, at the same time the United States saw its African-American population rally to bring ever-increasing pressure against both the formal structures of Jim Crow segregation in the South as well as the de facto racial inequities present throughout the nation. This new energy and the struggle for civil rights bore fruit over time, but not without facing and overcoming determined, organized, and sometimes violent opposition by white segregationists and their allies in the government. Tennessee shared this experience with the white population trying a host of tactics that shared the aim of preventing integration. From violence in Clinton to harassment of black children in the slowly desegregating schools of Nashville, the state's most hesitant districts held out until their hands were forced by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Lee then is far from the vanguard of this movement. Even after the Brown decision created an opportunity, and this would be what I would argue would be my, our, our first missed opportunity. So when Brown opens the possibility that you could welcome black students to Lee, welcome African American students, we don't take advantage of that. Um, both Lee and the Church of God, I think, allowed inertia and tradition to prevent them from accepting, much less embracing integration for another 12 years. So Brown's at 54, we don't desegregate until 66. That's, that's a long time. And while the slow move towards integration was not unusual for colleges and universities in the South, Lee and the Church not only missed a chance to lead, but they regularly took positions that placed them in a position of active resistance to integration. When change did come, it was led by a college administration that understood that in integration was inevitable and prodded uh, the denomination into action. So the school actually prods the Church of God into action. In 1958, the Church of God has about 5,000 African American members. Um, there are other alternatives that are Pentecostal for African Americans. The Church of God is a, a segregated institution, sometimes less attractive. And they're under the administration of an overseer for colored work who oversees the black congregations. And until 1958, certainly, there's a great deal of autonomy within those black, those black denominations. They're able to run their own affairs. Um, they had their own state and national conferences. There was a, the overseer was an African-American. Um, however, 
1958, the Executive Council appointed a white minister to be the general overseer for colored work. And there's a good deal, obviously, a good deal of opposition to this move at the time. Um, the church cited need for better accountability and for some pretty serious, what they called, what was the word, personalities within the church that were in conflict within the black church. Um, it should come as no surprise then, given the way the church is structuring, that Lee chose not to take an opportunity of, and I put the document before, I know it's hard to read, but this is September 1955, and you'll see that an African-American pastor and his wife applied to Lee for admission in the spring 1956 semester. Um, and, the, and the school decided not to take advantage of that. Um, the next year, they'll deny for sure at least one more applicant, a man named Vernon Springer, who applies. Now, this is a little tricky, and we're about to catch a big gap in sources. One of the things that makes researching Lee history difficult is that we didn't have a formal system of archiving our materials, our meeting, board minute meetings, our faculty minutes meetings, or just about anything else. And I see David Roebuck's here, and thank you, David, because how many years ago now was it when, when you got the call? <laughs> he, he, he got a call from our administration that said they were going to get rid of a bunch of documents. And they had a, a, what, a whole room, a basement full of files and documents. And they gave um, Dr. Roebuck a chance to go in, and I think he had two or three days to do a quick look and determine what needed to be kept. <coughs> and if not for that, we would have lost all of the records of the school. They just would have been thrown away, and we would have lost that history entirely. He salvaged amazing materials, um, especially for my benefit, the correspondence of the president. So one of the things they were going to throw away were all the letters the president wrote as president, all the official correspondence, you know, to and from the church, to and from individuals, all that would have been lost. And so that was one of the sources I looked at. He was also able to salvage, however, minutes from various meetings. And, and as you know from our minutes, Minutes are meant to obscure as much as they are meant to inform future generations. I mean, there's often notes that say, a vigorous discussion ensued. I want to know what was the vigorous discussion. It doesn't say, right? It just says they, they talked about it and a decision was made. And we've all been in those vigorous discussions, and we don't want to be named, and we don't want to let those things be known. But this is a huge source for me then, and, and I'm, I'm grateful that the PRC holds those and has gone through, there's still boxes yet to be organized, but most of the, the, the core of the collection is now available. And this is a document from that collection then. And it actually shows then, Robert Philip B. Simmons of Cleveland, Tennessee, appeared before the administration requested admission to Lee College for his wife and himself. Given the context, September 55, this is, this is not, and you'll also note his, the age, right? So 63 and 52. These are not under. These are not 18-year-olds wanting to go to school. This is a pastor and his wife who are known leaders in the community, who were active in civil rights, who are testing Lee, and they said, "Given this new context, can we be admitted?" And the answer it says in this case says, "Hey, the one that we referred it to the board, and the board said no." So this was the first missed opportunity, really. I mean, if you to be cutting edge, this would have taken in the context of the time. Enormous bravery, to be quite honest. This, this would have taken something that probably few of us would have, had, um, would have had the fortitude to step forward in that way in this fight. The church itself wasn't clear on what it was going to do about civil rights. Um, it's not surprising that the school decides to wait and see. Um, as a matter of fact, we'll find out a lot of schools decided to wait and see. You know, how would this work out? Would this persist? Because it's not clear immediately that, that civil rights would work. In fact, immediately after Brown, there's um, a whole series of events throughout the South in which there are what's, what's called massive resistance. There's a call for resistance to integration. And, and it is, in fact, massive. And it expresses itself in a number of ways. There are white citizens' councils which form in, in cities. And these citizens' councils are formed for the express um, reason to keep African Americans from achieving civil rights, from, from avoiding integration in the cities. There are, there's also the Southern Manifesto. I don't know, I know I'm drawing deep on your history here. The Southern Manifesto was signed by Southern congressmen and Southern senators that said, 
these issues of integration are states' rights issues. They're not federal issues. And as these representatives in Congress, we think this is essentially an unconstitutional decision that the court made. But I think what most people did is they just relied on inertia. They said, you know what, we're gonna, this will blow over. You know, we'll, we'll wait this out. We will find a way to get around the system. Remember, you know, blacks can't vote in the South. They're segregated in the South, right? And they're confined to the lowest bar of the socioeconomic run. That's even though in place of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. You know, 13th Amendment said no slavery. Well, they aren't slaves, of course, but yet they're sharecroppers who are often in debt peonage, who are, um, in fact, we'll talk to a daughter of one a little bit later in the paper, who can't advance. And there's Jim Crow. So the 14th Amendment, which dealt with race and also immigrants, suggested, strongly right, that Jim Crow shouldn't exist, that you shouldn't have this notion. Plessy versus Ferguson says separate but equal accommodations are okay. As long as there are black schools and white schools, then everything's fair. My father went to a segregated high school in East Texas. He went to Woodville High School. And there's also Scott High School. Both, all the black students had a high school and the white students had a high school. And football teams and books and chairs and desks. However, Scott High School got all the hand-me-downs from Woodville High School. So all their books are the ones that the white students had worn out that were passed down to Scott. Now they all had textbooks, separate but equal. Scott High was in the old Woodville High School. Scott High's uniforms came handed down from Woodville High. And that's a workaround. And I think many white citizens in the South hope that after Brown versus the board, there'd be a similar way to work around the decision. And so inertia, just wait, right? Wait this out. And there's a number of ways this was, that whites tried to work around the problem. And time will keep me from waxing eloquently, I guess, on that. On the other hand, after Brown versus the board, we know that what we, what I tell my students is the, the civil rights movement. I mean, we tend to capitalize it in the United States, you know, like it was the only one. But King's civil rights movement and the movement he inspired begins to pick up momentum. And you start to see marches, the sit-ins. In, in, in 62, Meredith goes to Ole Miss and desegregates Ole Miss. In 1963, Medgar Evers is assassinated in Mississippi which will bring the Mississippi summer effort of 1964. So while there's massive resistance on one side, within the landscape of the South and within the landscape of higher education, there's this, this thing that's pushing against that inertia, right? This momentum gathering to recognize and realize a real change in the South as well. For me, what's frustrating is that the record that we have is largely silent between 56 and about 63. It's about seven years where there's just a gap. And the research I've been doing is, is almost well, it's all dependent on primary sources. I can't go and pull six histories of Lee University and do what my undergrads like to do, and that is summarize those six into an encyclopedia article. So when there's a gap, there's just a gap. So this is a bit frustrating, but there's gonna be the silence in the record, at least for me, at this point for several years. But during that time, we do know that this is happening. There's resistance, but there's also the momentum of the civil rights movement taking place. So these two things are pushing. I suspect, you know, from, from what I've read and what we'll see, is that the church was still, and the school, were still looking for, and I should note, you, sh you shouldn't separate the two very much at this point. We're used to modern Lee. But if you're talking about Lee in the 1960s, Lee is simply an arm of the Church of God, like the publishing house is an arm of the Church of God. And so any, at some point, even decisions like, do you want to buy new dorm furniture, goes to the church. So it's, it's very carefully controlled. It's a very narrowly sectarian school. But I suspect, and I, well, I'll mention here in a second, is I think that they were looking for a workaround. And this is what's dis the, the second great disappointment for me then. The second missed opportunity, if you will, is that Lee doesn't, um, doesn't look for opportunities to integrate. It doesn't look for uh, how can we do this in the, in the quickest way possible, which is the smoothest way, where, where it's acceptable. Instead, they look for ways not to integrate. And that's, the second, that's my second disappointment. That's my second missed opportunity, is that they actively look not to integrate. All right. The next figure, I have this picture here. Some of y'all know who this is. This is? This is Ray Hughes. And one of the interesting things for me doing my research is, now I know who all these buildings are named after. You know, <laughs> I didn't, it's like most of y'all, you know, you know there are all these halls and then you start doing the research, oh, 
oh, general overseer, president, general overseer, president, general overseer and president. And, you know, you, you start to figure out who these people are. Hughes, I, I'm, I'm starting to believe, is one of the more important sort of transitional figures in Lee's history. He, he was uh, president for, um, I guess, six years. But he's president in this really critical time, um, in this transitional time. And when he took over the school in 1960, the school was in serious distress. And we know this isn't the first, you probably don't know, it's not the first time we were in distress, and it's not the last time we were in distress. But it, but it, was, really, um, it was really problematic. Um, the enrollment in 1957 was 436 students, which sounds, I know, really dangerously low to you. That was pretty typical for BTS years. That, that was fairly stable. By 1960, it's 337. So that's, yeah, that's a 25% drop. And the school had gone through three presidents in a five-year period. So there's not stability in leadership either. When Hughes takes office in 1960, then the college is in crisis. The denomination reluctantly grants emergency funding to keep the doors of its flagship institution open. And under Hughes' leadership, then, the college transforms itself. He took over the school, really, this right on the verge of failing, and left it pretty secure. It's still very narrowly sectarian, um, but he, he helps create a liberal arts college. Um, his list of accomplishments includes, he, let's see, um, accreditation. He, he, he leaves just before the formal accreditation comes down, but he's critical in helping move us. It's one of his goals to achieve accreditation. So he's critical in putting us on that path. Enrollment doubled to 898. Um, new buildings went up under his administration. Um, the faculty improved largely because the, you needed to improve faculty to get accreditation. New programs emerged. He, he started with a hodgepodge of experiments. And we know Lee likes to experiment even to this day. We have this sort of entrepreneurial bit to us. But we had a, we had a four year academy, we had a secretarial school, and a music school, and a correspondence school in a, a failed four-year Bible college, in a two-year junior college, and I'm missing one. There's another one, all on one campus. Clown college. A what? Clown college. Maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, not, not that bad. But it was, it was really, and, he, and when, when, what he takes us on is the road to where we emerge as a four-year art school, this consolidated school. He's also going to oversee and be president, note, in this period of change when it has to do with race and integration and the racial problem. He's going to be the president that's, that's at the forefront in this discussion. And, and he's a little complicated on, on this. I'll, I'll try to bring that out as well. So by night, I'm going to pick up the story again in 1963. By 63, the world has changed. It's no longer 1954 or 5. A lot has taken place. And the context ultimately has changed. I have my, my three words. And I'm going to leave this slide up for a second. Let me mention context at least. Um, Meredith, I mentioned in 62. In 63, you have the Birmingham marches, and you have the DC march by Dr. King. Mayor Evers is assassinated in 63. Um, the freedom rides have taken place. The sit in movement has swept the South. So by 63, there's a lot of momentum built towards achieving some success in civil rights on a national level. Um, and it's in this context, then, that in, on August 12, 1963, Lee's board of directors held a special meeting in which they unanimously approved a motion that asked for guidance from the church. So in this case, the president goes to the board, our board, and the board asks the church, what should we do about the racial problem, right? Quote, whereas the matter of integration of races at Lee College has come to the attention of the Lee College administration, and whereas the matter has far reaching ramifications, be resolved, we, the Lee College Board of Directors, respectfully request the board, Supreme Council to advise on behalf of the General Church as to the formulation of policy concerning this matter, unquote. So this is our school asking the church, what are we, what are we going to do about this? I like that it's come to their attention. It's very clearly by 1963 at their attention. Given that, there was a segregationist policy already in place within the church and the school. I think it's pretty clear the board is asking the denomination for support in looking at a more progressive policy in this case. What the board didn't know is that the Supreme Council's Committee on <coughs> Colored Work, this is the church's committee, would deliver a report the next day to the Supreme Council that stated, quote, it does not seem feasible to integrate our colleges in the immediate future, unquote. So that's in August 63. So the church 
already had a committee looking at the question and it already decided it wouldn't be feasible. On August 16th, the Supreme Council approved a resolution of its own. They called for prayer on the matter, of course, but argued that, quote, you see it here, as much as no local situation prevails that would call for immediate action at this time, we feel that it is not necessary for your committee to draft any resolution concerning the racial situation for public consumption. No, the council furthermore handed the issue back to the college. It will be left entirely up to the Lee College Board of Directors and the President to take whatever steps they deem necessary and expedient if, qualifier, you are to, if, you, if you are confronted with a crisis relative to the above mentioned problem. The Supreme Council's response then <laughs> provides little guidance, but instead created a series of caveats and conditional clauses that both stopped progress on integration and effectively passed responsibility to the board if there was a crisis at hand. So it's, it's pretty clever in a sort of a political way, but what it does is it essentially says we're not gonna take action on this issue of the racial problem of integration at this point. President Hughes' role in this decision making is difficult to ascertain. I have, I have, actually it's not as difficult, I'm just not ready to say it just yet. On the one hand, he clearly influenced the board's decision to ask for guidance. Um, you can see that he actually sat on the committee that helped you know, create this board, res or the, the council resolution. On the, on the other hand, he sat on the resolution committee that drafted the denomination's response. So as the president, he goes to the board and says, we need to do something about the racial problem. Let's ask for guidance from the church. And I think, given the context, he means something progressive. At the same time, he was on the committee that said, no, not unless there's an emergency, maybe. So he, he's playing both sides, if you will. Um, his level of influence is unclear, but later events suggest that he was reluctant to integrate, but understood the changing climate and wanted the college to be able to act if necessary. So he sees the handwriting on the wall. He just doesn't like the handwriting necessarily on the wall. To make matters more interesting, as the Supreme Council was meeting, Hughes had already allowed seven African Americans from the Church of God to participate in leadership training conferences held at Lee. There's no record of the reasoning that went into the decision to open the conference to black congregants, but both Context and Hughes' own correspondence suggests the decision was deliberate. Hughes appears to have been following the lead of schools like Vanderbilt, which integrated elements of its graduate schools before integrating its undergraduate programs. Lee had no graduate programs to try this out on, but an event like the Leadership Conference might well have played a similar role. It would have allowed the college to desegregate an event officially held on campus, test the waters, then move forward or back from that point. As Hughes tersely put it though, the experiment, quote, did precipitate some difficulty, unquote. The feedback Hughes received about the conference and again, this is where the correspondence is invaluable. Suggests the depths of opposition from some within the church to desegregation. It also, and I don't have time to do it, it also suggests there are people within the church that are very much for integration. So the church is split on this matter. One church member wrote of his shock to see black people on campus and in the workshops. He had heard of Lee's, quote, fine Christian background and principles, but my dreams fell when I saw the school integrated as it was, unquote. His concern was such that despite his commitment to Christian education, he cannot imagine sending his children to Lee. He concluded his letter by warning, quote, that the integration of Lee College would be a fatal mistake to the Church of God, unquote. In reply, Hughes made assurances that there were no black students enrolled for the fall semester, which is true. More tellingly, he made a personal, not policy, statement in the letter. And he's really clear in the letter. This is not policy. This is me, just speaking. Quote, I do not believe in integration as such but I do believe in desegregation. <laughs> I, I had to ponder this one for a while, to be honest. I do not believe in integration as such, but I do believe in desegregation. By this, I mean that all people should have equal rights in equal facilities. Although I do not feel that it is the best thing, yet it seems that the integration of our schools is inevitable. So this is Hughes' personal stance. In other words, he believed that you should have a real implementation of Plessy. Separate the races, but give them both high quality educations. But at the same time, he's a realist. He, he reads, he's, he's very much, he, there's volumes of clippings and material. He knows what's happening in society. He knows this is coming, right? Here he seems to take the position held by many segregations, especially around Atlanta. 
that the races should be separated, but that African Americans deserve equal facilities. It's no wonder then that Hughes was loath to fully integrate Lee and believed that, quote, when integration does come, that it will have to be on a limited scale for a time at least, unquote. Um, no, I'll stop. I'll, I'll, I was about to go off on another tangent. In November 1963, the university received a communication from the United States Commission on Civil Rights, indicating it was preparing a directory of institutions of higher education that showed admission policies and practices as they pertained, pertained, pertained to race. Attached to that letter was a list of public and private universities in Tennessee and their admissions policies. The results show that Lee was far from alone among the state's private colleges in resisting integration. The reality made more evident by a complete absence of a category for schools that had measured, I think I have that, yeah, put it up. Um, there's an absence of a category for schools that achieve a measure of proportional integration. So there's not, your choices are segregated or predominantly. There's no like <coughs> truly integrated category for this box. And the numbers are roughly equal. So you can see that a number of schools have desegregated but a number have not as well. You just you can look at the numbers and I don't have to speak to that. It's also worth noting here that desegregation in these early years rarely meant real integration. It was relatively easy to admit a handful of minority students and achieve desegregation, technically. But achieving a culture with racial diversity in which students are seen as individuals to be treated with dignity and respect rather than members of a group intruding on maturity culture, that, that's rare. However, as 1964 began, both Lee and the Church of God were far from either mark. Instead, they were considering how to create a Lee College extension in Atlanta for African American students. So as late as 1964, they're still thinking there's a workaround, right? If, if we create an extension of Lee College in Atlanta that's still Lee, but separate for African American students, that would meet the letter of the law, they thought. Which is remarkable because that's that's Plessy thinking, <coughs> not not Brown thinking. The other thing that's happening, if if you know your history, I know you all do, so that your American history is clear in your mind. Something else is coming in 1964, and that's a vote on a major piece of civil rights legislation, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And the, the school administration and the church is very aware these things are coming. They don't live in a vacuum. These are informed, educated, thoughtful people, and with that vote on civil rights legislation coming, on May 26, 1964, the Church of God Supreme Council, with Lee's board in attendance, so they're all in the same room, adopted a motion to integrate all educational institutions of the church. I can't remember what my next slide is. It's, it's, it's that one. On the surface, the policy and its attendant preface integrated Lee, but that's not the case for three reasons. So this is 1964. We won't admit our first black student at Lee until 1966 in the fall. First, the council and Lee's board of directors clearly believe that opening Atlanta extension for black students qualified as integration. They're still very active on this front, thinking that would meet the letter of the law. Second, the council chose not to send the policy change to the general council, a decision that would have opened up the integration question to the scrutiny of the broader church membership. So this was held only at, at the top level of the church. And finally, the decision had absolutely no impact on the segregated operation of Lee College. So the, the statement is passed, but it's passed only at the highest levels, held secretly at the highest levels, if you will, held in confidence. This hesitancy was not limited to the college, but was part of the council's broader, I would argue, confusion is how to engage integration in civil rights. A subcommittee considering a resolution on race relations was equally unsure how to proceed. In a statement to church leadership, they noted the race issue, and it's almost always called the racial issue, the race issue was both a cultural and moral problem that created a dilemma for a denomination that accommodated a segregated culture, that saw the strength of the civil rights movement, anticipated federal action on the matter, and had just passed a motion to integrate its educational institutions. Faced with such issues in a church that had yet to come to grips with the changing nature of race relations, an exasperated committee asked the Supreme Council to take up the matter as a whole and provide for it, quote, at least some inkling, unquote, as to the council's mind on the matter. In other words, the, the, the subcommittee had no idea what the church was going to do. The leadership, however, resisted change and continued to explore a segregated school for African Americans. On May 26th, the Supreme Council, sorry, the Church of God Supreme Council, with Lee's board and, whoa, did I just read that twice? 
Yeah, I think I did. Um, let's try this again. Um, which brings us to actually to desegregation. So this is a, this is a positive outcome number one. I've got a little bit ahead of myself, but I wanted you to see the the um, resolution. On July second, nineteen sixty four, Congress passes the Civil Rights Act. It denied federal funds to schools who discriminated against students on the basis of color. That's part of a broader act that was passed. Lee depended on federal aid through a handful of direct grants, not many of those, but as today, on a great deal of indirect support. So this is support through students who benefited from college board study programs, the GI Bill, and other federal programs. Within a month of the passage of the Civil Rights Act, Hughes had again requested that the congregational leadership allow him to formally and publicly announce Lee's integration. But even in the face of the federal mandate, the segregationist policy remains in place for another two years. In the end, it may have been the financial balance sheet that pushed the school and the denomination to the tipping point. So you recognize this, there's a great deal of pressure now mounted against the school. In January uh, 1966, a letter from the federal government required Lee to show evidence that it was in compliance with the provisions of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act or lose its funding. This is real clear, it just says, it's real polite. The government just says, could you please show us the evidence so we can continue your funding? And when I read this, I thought, wow, if, how are they going to do that? And you know how they're going to do that, right? Because technically, what have they already done? Well, the college immediately, and I think rather disingenuously, assured the government's in compliance, citing the May 64 resolution that desegregated all educational facilities. So in 64, they passed this resolution, put it in their pocket for the day when they need it. And that day came in January when the government said, so you are desegregated, right? And they said, yes, yes we are. But when they did that and informed the government, this means then that they're gonna actually have to act. Right? You, 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 know, you have to actually now desegregate at this point. And so this is my first positive outcome. And you know, this isn't a willing choice. The school's not looking to integrate. The, the school has to integrate. And I think that's, that's, that's one of the great, you look back, it's a, it's a disappointment. I understand the context, I understand the weight of tradition and culture, the difficulties of this, but it, it's still hard not to be disappointed that we didn't act before 1966 to integrate. So while long in coming, Lee's use of a 20-month-old resolution was not a public statement meant to announce to the church, to the community, or to the nation that it abandoned this discrimination against African Americans. Nonetheless, uh, although a private document, it, it best is you can consider it a hope for the future, I think. At worst, you know, this was a contingency, and I've just gotten back, re retraced my steps a little bit. I think the most important thing is we cross the Rubicon at this moment, right? You know, when you report to the government you're going to be desegregated, you better have evidence that you're desegregated. And clearly an Atlanta extension isn't going to get the job done. We finally abandoned that. Um, the statement also provided a couple of interesting things. One, a clear faith-based rationale for desegregation that cited the authority of Scripture, not the federal government, as, as it should have. Um, that stance, which one will remember was the position held by the church's governing body, soon translated to the denomination as a whole. On August 15, 1966, the last day of the Church of God's General Assembly, the denomination passed a resolution that officially desegregated all branches of the church by eliminating any race-based or colored designations. I think if, if federal funding was our tipping point, then it also probably was the church's tipping point as well. So positive outcome number two. We, we admitted black students to leave at last in, in the fall of 1966. Um, we admit three students, it turns out. When it came to actually admitting black students, Lee's administration took a very cautious approach that allowed desegregation to take place with little fanfare. In the fall of 1966, three students, Deborah Bacon, Hazel Edwards, and Larry Cox, some of you knew these people, enrolled at Lee and began classes. Bacon was a local woman who lived at home while attending classes. For Lee's administrators, she must have been the perfect student to help incrementally break that color line. Um, by separating classroom from living space. So a person, uh, you could desegregate the school while not having a black student in the dorms. Selective, if you will, uh, desegregation. Um, the record on Cox is less clear. Um, and, and most of what I know about these people is, is not so much from records, but from talking to 
some of the students were from this first generation who desegregated. Um, he enrolled but dropped out after just a few weeks. I don't, I'm not 100% sure why. I've heard two or three different reasons, but he didn't persist. I don't, as far as I know, it was not because that he was pushed out by students, that there was something else going on there. So Cox doesn't persist. So Deborah Bacon is going to be there for the first year. Cox leaves after a couple of weeks. And the third person who is, I, I could tell stories about for a while, I've talked to her extensively, is Hazel Edwards. Hazel Edwards Ivy now. And Hazel, Hazel was an unexpected pioneer in desegregation because the school thought she was white when they admitted her. <laughs> so, so Bacon, they admitted, a local girl who could live at home, go to her church, be supported by the local African-American community, come to classes and go back, right? I don't know about Cox. I, just, I don't know. I, I wish I knew more. I'm work, working on it. Um, but with, with Hazel Edwards, she, she, she was at a state convention in Mississippi. She's the, she's the daughter of sharecroppers. And she was at the state convention, the colored convention, when a man, a white man came and just said something about Lee. Because, you know, technically we had desegregated. And in her words, she said, well, I said, she said, I took him at his word. That, like, Lee was a place I could go to school. There's this daughter of sharecroppers, the first person in her family to go to university. And she said, it's a church you got to school. And it seems to be, I mean, it seems to be open. She had no idea that she was a pioneer. She had no idea that she was going to be one of the first. She just applied. And the way, the way Lee did things, it said, you know, where are you from? There wasn't a box, it said white, black, whatever, but you had to attach a picture. And these are black and white pictures. And you can see this, this is Edwards. Edwards had, has pretty light skin, and she straightened her hair, and they thought she was white. So she was the other, the third person that came. And she did get assigned to a dorm, and she showed up, and her white roommate, well, really her white roommate's family, this sort of, went, there was a mushroom cloud over, I, I don't know what, Simmons or something, and, and the, the family said, no way, my daughter's going to be rooming with a black, with a black woman. And according to um, Ms. Ivy, she was called to the, the, the dean of women's office, and the dean said, we've got a problem, and I'm really sorry about this. I, it was very apologetic. She said that her family is apoplectic about this, and, you know, Y'all aren't going to be able to live together. And, and she, Miss, Miss Ivy's, I, 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 is, she's really interesting because her reply was simply, well, where is she going to move? <laughs> <laughs> and, the dean of women, and the dean of women, interestingly enough, took the two women out of the next door room, moved them, and put the, this other girl next door to her. And so they didn't live together, but she also didn't remove her from everyday interacting with, with Hazel. Um, I have more, I, I gotta stop. Stories, stories are fun. Um, there's a lot of interesting stories from this first generation, but it, it, it's a remarkable thing, and it, it's best I can tell, and I, I haven't been able to contact Bacon. I would love to meet her. I don't know if she's alive or here. I had a student call all the Bacons in two counties and couldn't find anybody related to her, but I'd love to know if they knew. Did you know what you were doing? Did you know what you were stepping into? Um, Hazel said no. She said it was a shock. She said I cried for the first two weeks. And then decided, you know what? I'm going to do this. And from everything I can tell about her character, that, that what you would expect from her, that she would decide and settle and go about this. So this is certainly our, our first positive outcome as we allow African Americans into lead. I would argue we desegregated. We didn't necessarily integrate. That, that is, we met the letter of the law. Um, you're still looking at, I think, 10 students for the first few years. It's about the total, so about 1% of the population were African Americans. Um, some would be athletes that came in. Some were uh, just people that wanted education. Most that weren't athletes just wanted to go to Church of God school. It, this was the Church of God school. This is the Pentecostal school they came to. So this is the first positive outcome is that, in fact, we did ad admit students. The, the third missed opportunity, I would argue, is I wish we had done it publicly. As best I can find, there's no record we didn't announce that we had desegregated. We didn't announce it to the church. We didn't announce it to the local community. We didn't announce it to the Lee community. As best I can tell, they didn't even talk about it in internal memos to each other. 
So when the president, and, and Hughes leaves, I guess, in June of 66, so he's, he's gone. But when the president does his yearly report for 66, 67, he talks about air conditioning and new furniture and a roof, but never mentions the fact that Lee was desegregated. And this is an internal report from the president to the board of directors. And so as best I can tell, there's never a sort of a, okay, we've done this thing, now let's openly accept, embrace, right, engage. That that doesn't happen. And that's, I guess, the next disappointment. This is actually, you can tell, that there are very interesting days and events going on in 66, 67. And if we have time, I can, I can tell you some more about this and, and other pictures like it. This just students in blackface, because of course, why, why would you not be in blackface doing, a, doing an event on campus? And so there's, there's um, a lot of work to be done, shall we say, still elite within that culture. So there's, there's no real recognition of what we did. There's no publication to our broader community of what we did. And for a while, at least, there's still not integration. There's still not you know, a truly trying to integrate the campus, I think. But the last positive outcome, and I know I need to, I need to finish up. The last positive outcome is that, that the school, as best I can tell, was very good to the students who arrived here. The administration, the RA, the RD, the team, the professors, and most of the students, overwhelmingly the students, I would argue, were good to those African Americans who made this first step to these pioneers. And that is encouraging. You know, as I talked to these people, I wondered, you know, what sort of re reception did they get? And it was good. They had a few incidents within the community or with a couple of individual students at Lee, but overwhelmingly said the, the professors, their peers, um, the administration supported them and took care of them and welcomed those individuals that were here into school. And that, that I am proud of. And that's a very positive outcome. Um, in 1970, then, we graduate our three, first three African American students from Lee. Um, you see Molly Edmond and Hazel Edwards and Pauline Washington. And I've talked to Edwards in Washington, but again, um, I haven't talked to Molly Edmond, so I suspect she's in Atlanta someplace. It's a very, very troubling, you know, how in modern society you look for people. I often feel guilty. Um, you shouldn't be on, well, sending your students to Facebook and other social media platforms, hoping to find the grandmother posting pics. Um, but that, but that's, that's what I've resorted to. So these are the first three. Interestingly, though, I think none of them to appear to have sought this role as civil rights pioneer, as small southern sectarian school. I think their quiet resolve to earn a degree speaks a great deal about their character and their commitment to education. As for Lee, while his dedication to creating safe spaces for new black students should be recognized, appreciated, and applauded, um, I think he didn't miss these opportunities. He missed an opportunity in, in, in 54, 55, especially in December of 55, to really be on the forefront. And as I said, that would have taken immense courage to pull that off. I think it missed our, a second opportunity ongoing to, to look for ways to integrate instead of to look for ways not to integrate. You know, everything I read was how do we not do this? How do we resist this? And the third thing, I wish we'd published, and I don't mean you know, published like our publications, but I wish we had published broadly what we were doing. And we said, we, we've done this, this is a right thing, this is a good thing, this is a scriptural thing, I wish we had done that. On the other hand, we did, finally, late, I think, integrate and we took very good care of those students and they went on to great success. Um, the two people I'm, I, well the one person I mentioned for sure, I don't know about Begin, um, Hazel Edwards Ivy went on to get a master's degree um, in education. Her children, I think she has six, four of them have PhDs. So education translated down the line. Now, things that I don't understand, CDC work, Christmas, that sort of stuff. Um, Pauline Washington who you see in the top right corner she, she came to Lee because she was at a, a fundamentalist school in Washington, D.C. that wouldn't let her graduate because she was Pentecostal. So she came here not knowing she was a pioneer either. She went on to get her doctorate. So, again, this, this start, this opening we made had real impact.